A diplomatic row has broken out over a new defence and security partnership between Britain, America and Australia. C'est vraiment en bon français euh, un coup dans le dos. This really is a stab in the back. It's time for some of our dearest friends around the world to prendre un grip, donner moi un break. Well, it's quite funny, but if Boris Johnson thought that lame bit of franglais was going to end the AUKUS argument with France, he was very much mistaken. Two weeks after announcing a new military alliance with the Americans and Australians that cut France out of the action, the row is still very much alive. In fact, the French are now talking about creating a defence strategy just for the Europeans. Les Européens doivent sortir de la naïveté. Lorsque nous sommes sous l'effet de pression, de puissances qui parfois se durcissent. Réagir, montrer que nous avons avec nous aussi la puissance et la capacité à nous défendre n'est pas céder à l'escalade. C'est simplement nous faire respecter. Meanwhile, in Australia, the former Prime Minister is having a massive dig at his successor for undoing his agreement with the French and signing a new one with America and Britain. John Yves Le Drian, the Foreign Minister, when he said it was a stab in the back, uh, was not expressing, was not speaking just for himself. There is outrage, absolute outrage, because what it tells you is that Australia can't be trusted. Now, for those of you who are following this story, those two sound bites will make perfect sense. But if you haven't been following the story, or can't quite remember the details, here's a quick reminder of what the AUKUS ruckus is all about. The United States, Australia and the United Kingdom have long been faithful and capable partners. We all recognize the imperative of ensuring peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific over the long term. The future of the Indo-Pacific will impact all our futures. And so, friends, AUKUS is born. The first major initiative of AUKUS will be to deliver a nuclear-powered submarine fleet for Australia. The UK, US and Australia have announced a historic security pact in the Asia-Pacific. It'll allow Australia to build nuclear-powered submarines for the very first time. The UK, Australia and the US will be joined even more closely together. One issue not mentioned by the three leaders, but clearly driving this move, a rising China. Cooperation between the United States, the UK and Australia over nuclear submarines has seriously undermined regional peace and stability. It's a clear pushback against China in the Pacific, but France is furious. That's because the Australian government cancelled a multi-billion dollar contract for French submarines. France has withdrawn its ambassadors from Australia and the United States in retaliation for that decision. I think uh, this has been a huge mistake, a very, very bad handling of a partnership. France sees this as literally a knife in the back. I'm really angry and bitter about this breach of contract. It was a very difficult decision. And of course we had to weigh up what would be the, the obvious disappointment to France. But at the end of the day, as a government, we have to do what is right for Australia and serve Australia's national security interests. Cette décision, this unilateral, brutal, unpredictable decision looks a lot like what Mr. Trump used to do. The president acknowledged uh, that there could be uh, more of a, there could have been more discussion in advance of the announcement. Does your government feel betrayed? Uh, by the United States. Yes, we, we have a, we have this feeling. We it's it's disappointing. It's time for some of our dearest friends around the world to, you know, prone and grit, don't in one and break. I find it very hard to see in this uh, agreement anything not to like. Well, he would say that, wouldn't he? But is he being flippant? After all, the French did have a deal with the Australians going back to 2016, when Australia's then-PM, Malcolm Turnbull, signed an agreement with a partly French government-owned company called Naval Group to design their new generation of diesel-electric powered subs. Well, that was followed up in 2019 with another deal with Naval Group to build those subs in Australia. Then, on September the 15th, without any warning, the Australians, now led by Scott Morrison, revealed they'd scrapped the project in favour of a new deal with the British and the Americans 
for nuclear-powered subs. A really big deal, yet at one point, Biden couldn't even remember who he was talking to. Thank you, Boris. And, and I want to thank uh, that fellow down under. Thank you very much, pal. Appreciate it, Mr. Prime Minister. Well, that was a lighter moment for some, but the French were not amused. Remember, they were given no warning about this. In fact, they say the Australian military officials sent them a letter confirming they were extremely satisfied with French submarines just hours before they announced the $65 billion deal was cancelled. The Australians say the French are exaggerating the significance of the letter. The diplomatic fallout has been extraordinary. At the time of recording, the French president still not talking with the Australian prime minister, nor has he reinstated the French ambassador to Canberra. Monsieur Macron's been a bit softer with the Americans, speaking to President Biden just about five days after the big announcement, and he has just sent France's ambassador back to Washington. But what about the Brits? Why didn't France put its ambassador to London? Well, it wasn't out of love or respect. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Here's France's foreign minister, Jean-Yves Le Drian. We have recalled our ambassadors to Canberra and Washington, he's referring to, uh, to re-evaluate the situation. With Britain, there's no need. We know their constant opportunism, so there is no need to bring our ambassador back to explain. A Franco-British defence summit has been cancelled. A stinging rebuke. Another French official, unnamed, was even more scathing with this food-related metaphor. You complain about the bad food in a restaurant to the manager and the chef, not the dishwasher. And then there's tiny New Zealand, which wasn't even invited to the AUKUS party, even though it's Australia's closest neighbour in many ways and part of the Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Alliance that also includes Canada. New Zealand's PM Jacinda Ardern said she wouldn't have joined the party anyway. We weren't approached, but nor would I expect us to be. The centrepiece of this arrangement is the building of nuclear-powered submarines uh, to be based out of Australia. And Prime Minister Morrison and indeed all partners are very well versed and understand our position on nuclear-powered vessels and also nuclear weapons. They couldn't come into our internal waters. Our legislation uh, means that nothing that is wholly or fully powered, no vessel that is wholly or fully, uh, partially or fully powered by um, nuclear energy is able to enter into our internal waters. Now, despite all this criticism and pressure, Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison's feeling pretty good about his decision, and a new poll suggests a majority of Australians back him. According to a Guardian Essential poll, 62% believe it's a good idea for Australia to pursue the nuclear submarine deal with the US and the UK, and 54% agreed it is in the nation's best security and economic interests. However, 55% do think this would further upset relations with China. And, of course, China is very annoyed about all this, calling it an example of the West Cold War mentality. It's also worried about Australia a non-nuclear power getting its hands on nuclear material. It's highly possible that the U.S. and the U.K. export to Australia highly enriched uranium with over 90 percent purity, which is considered weapons-grade nuclear material. As a non-nuclear weapon state, Australia's acquisition of uranium with high energy density poses serious nuclear proliferation and security risks. The current system of the International Atomic Energy Agency cannot verify that Australia is not diverting highly enriched uranium from the power reactors of nuclear submarines for use in nuclear weapons. Well, let's bring in our guest now. And in London, we have Alessio Pantalano, an expert in East Asia warfare and security at King's College London, where he's a professor. In Paris, we have the French journalist Anne Elizabeth Moutet. And in Washington, D.C., Robert Spaulding, a retired U.S. Air Force stealth pilot and U.S.-China analyst. And in Beijing, we have Tong Zhao, who is from the Nuclear Policy Program at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Alessia, I'd like to start with you. I know this is your passion, this topic, and uh, your analysis is always very, very precise and detailed. So let me ask you this. When you look at this announcement and the way it was done, was it really worth it from, from uh, Australia's point of view, the way they've upset the French? So uh, the answer to your question should be divided really into two parts. There is the element that goes about the how, how the end of the contract with France uh, came to be. Um, and of course, that's one set of issues. Um, and then the other one that is the strategic question 
Um, was it worth from a strategic perspective? Of course it was, because what we're talking about is a considerable leap um, in terms of changes in capabilities. Nuclear-powered submarines will enable uh, the submarine force uh, to increase its operational flexibility, expand its missions, um, and if anything else, also extend its radius. But also, it's, it's a down payment in terms of uh, uh, future additional uh, capabilities, because at heart, a nuclear-powered engine allows you almost endless supply of energy and, and, and power, which for a submarine means that you can think about how to uh, top up as uh, additional sensors as new technologies become available. That same type of logic does not happen as easily with conventional powered submarines. And Elizabeth, I know there's been a lot of anger in Paris. The uh, ambassador was recalled from both Washington and Canberra. Uh, can I ask, why, why are the French so angry when, as Alessio says, the French don't have the technology that the Australians want? The French have the technology that the Australians demanded. The uh, Australian, we, we build nuclear subs. We, we have built something like 240 subs uh, in uh, the past decades, and 30 of those were nuclear. We have the technology. If you want it, you just have to point to the ship on the shelf and say, that's what I want. And they want a diesel. There are advantages to diesel submarines. Uh, uh, most of, uh, I mean, the, the, they have a very large uh, uh, um, reach, and they can be completely silent when you have a nuclear sub. The nuclear sub needs to have the uh, reactor uh, shielded and, and cooled, and the cooler has to stay on all the time. Whereas if you stop the engine of a, new, of a, a diesel sub, uh, then that's completely silent. So in terms of tactical reasons, that was the brief from the Australians, uh, and they never said that they wanted um, nuclear, because we, we, right. we offered them. But the problem the is... And Elizabeth, yes. the problem is, as uh, Scott Morrison said, it's not that they changed their minds, but that the, uh, the needs changed with China rising. Well, several things. But first of all, China was... It's more the perception of China rising, because China has been rising in the past three decades, so it was pretty obvious. Uh, but, again... Uh, they could have said, we want something else, and it was possible by specifically naval group to accommodate them on that. What they did instead was negotiate behind the back of the negotiators that they had parallel negotiations, keeping one secret from the other. I mean, I expect the Americans were actually aware that they had something going on with the French because that had been public, but they didn't tell the French. Uh, and, and suddenly, you know, last phone call, last minute, and it's, you know, it's all gone and we're not interested, we're going somewhere else. So uh, you can have different... Uh, different choices, although France was very keen on this on this alliance because we are actually very much present in the Indo-Pacific. Can I just put that to Alessio then, that they, the Australians could have picked from the shelf and got what they wanted from France? Uh, not necessarily, because when we ta we're talking about uh, 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 the fissile material that goes into a nuclear reactor, and, of course, the UK and the US use a highly enriched uh, uranium, um, um, France um, low enriched uranium, and um, that makes a, a considerable difference uh, because um, uh, uh, nuclear reactors produced uh, by the UK and the US, uh, you, you have the whole package, you don't have to open it, you have to, to sort of like service it um, uh, or change the fissile material. It, it's, a, it's a life to cycle. Um, engine. So once it's in the submarine, until you retire the submarine, there's really not much you have to do with right. the fissile materials. That's not the same with the type of reactors used in France, which required about every 10 years um, uh, a change of the, of the fissile material inside. So that would have raised a number of questions, not just in NPT, non-proliferation treaty terms, but also in technical terms, how France would have serviced that. Having said so, I think the other commentator is absolutely right that uh, at the moment it's very unclear why and if that conversation ever took place with France mm. and, and, and and exactly what kind of clarity was at well, this point. Well, well, that's the point, Anne Elizabeth. I mean, why didn't that conversation happen? Um, it, th there was a, a French diplomat who was saying basically it's not just a contract that they've broken, it's a partnership, something deeper. And mm. now people want to know, you know, the French, they don't feel they can trust the Americans anymore. Is that correct? 
I don't think we ever thought that we could trust the Americans 100%, but certainly it's gone down several notches. But the conversation could have happened with the French if the Australians and the Americans had decided to have it. And the other thing is that France enriches uranium. There were things and achievements that could be reached. As it is, the French submarines could be delivered by 2030, and the ones they opted for won't be delivered before 2040. And in the meantime, China is certainly being aggressive. Can I ask you about, we've, we've talked about the security military implications, what about the commercial concerns uh, for Naval Group? Um, they're apparently going to be sending a very big bill to Australia. They're going to send a bill for whatever it is that since uh, the, uh, the uh, first discussions in 2011 and then since the actual contract was signed, they're going to send this for the work that they did, the workers that they displaced and, and, uh, the, and uh, in general what it cost them for something that has been denounced without any kind of acceptable uh, uh, for you know, prior notice. So that's perfectly reasonable. You do that in any kind of business contract and mm. it's, it's in the provisions of the contract. Mm -hmm. And just political concerns now. Macron up for re-election. What does this do to him? As long as he complains loudly and bitterly and he complains <laughs> against the Anglo-Saxons, I think it's not harming him. And I'm, he's pretty much aware of that. Um, so, but I, I wouldn't say that his first, strangely enough, there's almost everything that I would say that his first concern is going to be the election. On this case, I think there's really a serious anger at the way that France was not well treated. You interrupted me when I said that France actually has a presence in the Indo-Pacific. We've got département, we've got, you know, places like Polynesia, and Nouvelle-Calédonie, mm. and in, in, we've got La Réunion and Mayotte in, in the Indian Ocean, and they send MPs to the National Assembly. These yes. are parts of France, and they're scattered all over, and we've got the Navy that goes with it. Oh, that's a really so good the point. alliance made sense. Let's take it to General Spaulding, then. General Spaulding, given what uh, Anne Elizabeth is saying about France's sort of relic of empire, really, the, the presence in the Indo-Pacific, why didn't the United States include France in this? Well, um, as you heard General Milley say yesterday, Afghanistan was a logistical success, but a strategic failure. In this case, it seems that AUKUS is a strategic success, but a diplomatic failure. The truth is AUKUS uh, heralds a return to a bipolar order, only instead of geography, what's really about data or the misuse of data. So we're not just going to focus now uh, the this relationship on military. It's now moving into technology, and I think it's going to further move in the future towards financial and economic, yeah. and even further uh, dividing of the two sides of the world. One free, one not. Can I ask you about that? We've got, um, obviously, nuclear submarines form a great part of AUKUS, but also uh, listed in the, uh, the pact is sharing of artificial intelligence, and cyber capabilities and quantum technology. This stuff is quite cutting edge. Can you just explain uh, why there, there was the need for an alliance to secure these? Well, what's happening today is, you know, after the end of the Cold War, we really created this globalized world where authoritarian regimes were able to deploy into democracies and really harness the technology of Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley created such an impressive ability to, to mine data and then influence their customers in ways that are counter to their interests. It heralded GDPR. And that is really what we're talking about here, the ability to influence beyond their borders and really to drive authoritarianism even broader into the free world. Uh, can I ask you about how the French have described uh, this whole thing, especially uh, they, they expected better, apparently, from Biden than of Trump. They say, you know, he's acted uh, as badly as Trump. Instead of brutally hurting them by tweet, it was by press conference. Uh, are you impressed or ashamed of Biden's performance here? Well, I wouldn't say um, this is um, not going to... This road to a new world order is not going to be uh, without its bumps, and I think this is probably the first bump. You know, when Churchill went in 1946 and gave his uh, Iron Curtain speech, not everybody agreed with that, particularly not every country in Europe. And so I think you're going to see a shifting of tides. Some countries are going to side with the authoritarians of the world. Some are going to side with the free world. And I think this is a right. beginning shot. At Tong Zhao, we've heard that the French have been insulted. It's a stab in the back. They've been betrayed. As for China, uh, they feel that th this has increased the threat against them. Um, they're particularly worried about uh, a Cold War mentality developing in the West, and they have nuclear concerns, which I'd like to get to in a moment. 
do you think these protestations are genuine, or do you think that China understands this is a, a natural result, a reaction to their behaviour and expansionism within the South China Sea and elsewhere? Well, in China, there is, there is no room for a public debate uh, about uh, whether Chinese behaviour is causing other countries uh, to have threat perceptions against China. Um, so I, I'm afraid that the domestic environment is reducing Chinese capacity to conduct uh, self-reflection. Therefore, uh, the mainstream view, the mainstream per perception um, is uh, very uh, consensual, which is, is all uh, the other powers, especially the United States, uh, who wants to contain China because China's peaceful rise has been challenging the predominant position of the United States in the international system. The U.S. is putting pressure on everyone else to join its fight against China. Uh, so that's the mainstream perception. There is no mm. room for you know, uh, substantive self-reflection. And it's hard to tell whether the government uh, narrative uh, is, is sincerely felt or is uh, you know, simply uh, making the United States, Australia and the UK look yeah. bad. And is it possible to gauge how serious uh, Beijing is when it says it's concerned about the uh, Americans and British sending nuclear material to Australia, which is a non-nuclear power? Uh, are they actually concerned about Australia and what they're going to do with this nuclear material? Well, I think uh, we have to understand, uh, due to the domestic environment uh, that has been uh, in, in this case for decades, uh, there is genuine paranoia. Um, there is genuine threat perception, uh, even among the policy experts community, uh, even, even within the policy experts community, let alone the general public. I think some Chinese experts are genuinely concerned that uh, this is a first step for Australia to eventually develop its nuclear weapon capability. Australia will use this highly enriched uranium uh, as an excuse to build up its indigenous uh, enrichment uh, infrastructure, and then it will go from there and eventually acquire Austria's own nuclear weapons. Uh, and all this submarine deal is basically an excuse created mm. by the United States and UK to help Australia to go nuclear. I think some there is definitely genuine concern uh, yeah. uh, within certain quarters. That's, uh, um... But maybe other experts, they have different views. Alessio, what do you make of that? Insofar as your original question is concerned, is AUKUS um, some sort of a manifestation of uh, a Cold War mentality? I don't think that's the case. Uh, because first of all, this is a wide-ranging pact that uh, looks at uh, science and tech um, and the role that they are likely to have in uh, uh, defense innovation. And it so happens that the first example of this cooperation is the submarine program. But the pact as such does not contain any NATO style um, automatic intervention collective defense arrangement. There is no Article 5 style um, uh, type of provision. Uh, so it is not coming from a mentality of a Cold War. It is not designed to contain. It is designed to shape the security environment on the premise that I think also General Spalding was alluding to, that today there is no prosperity without security. And whilst prosperity remains a common goal, in order to achieve that, security and the Indo-Pacific, that first and foremost means maritime security, you need to have that hard power element to it that ensures and underwrites the possibility to focus on prosperity. General Sporting, we're coming to the end of the show, but uh, there, there have been lots of commentators, particularly from the left, who say that this has made the world more dangerous, not less dangerous, and a collision with China more likely, not less likely. How would you respond to that? Well, I would argue, uh, especially given the way that China is threatening Taiwan, that the introduction of nuclear weapons into the Indo-Pacific actually may be a stabilizing feature. Today, we, we stand before the risk of war, uh, primarily because China seeks to you know, enslave the, the people of Taiwan. And uh, if you're going to create a, a barrier, a deterrent, if you will, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, perhaps nuclear weapons may be the answer. And Elizabeth Mute, final question for you regarding uh, this sort of 
almost a junior partner in all of this, the United Kingdom, according to the French. They say, French diplomats say, why didn't we recall the ambassador to the UK? Well, when you complain about the food in a restaurant, you go to the chef, you go to the waiter or whatever, the manager, you don't go to the dishwasher. Is that really how you see the UK in France? Not really, but then we are leaving the, uh, the, 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 the domain of, of uh, uh, geopolitics, which is serious, and we go into sort of usual French-British sn sniping, especially in the context of Brexit. And, and that was not the most mature thing we could have said, even though, especially since, we have lots of important things to say about this deal and the fact that it is, to our mind, it is weakening, not including France in it, is weakening the capacity of the free world, as was so well described, to defend itself together. Donnez-moi un break, says uh, Boris Johnson. Anyway, Anne Elizabeth, Alessio, Robert Spaulding and Tony Zhao, thank you all very much for your contributions to the Nexus and thank you at home and on your phones for watching. Remember, if you want to see this episode or any of our previous episodes, do go to our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Until next week, then, goodbye. <laughs>